The Clyde Beatty Show. The world's greatest wild animal trainer, Clyde Beatty, with another exciting adventure from his brilliant career. The circus means fun for both young and old. Thrills, excitement, snarling jungle beasts. But under the big top, where Clyde Beatty constantly risks death in the most dangerous act on Earth, you see only part of the story. Much of the real drama takes place behind the scenes of the circus, or in faraway places of the world where this master of the big cats has journeyed, hunting down his beasts in their native jungle. All of this is part of the Clyde Beatty story. Here is the exciting story, Time Off for Trouble. A few years ago, at the end of the regular circus season, we set up winter quarters in Shreveport, Louisiana. Only a skeleton crew remained to care for the animals and equipment, and of course my wife Harriet and I stayed on to supervise things. A few days after we got settled, I went into Shreveport to have my yearly physical checkup. Not that I thought anything was wrong, but I've found in my business it pays to know for sure that everything is perfect. Dr. Meyer gave me a thorough examination and then asked me to step into his office. Just have a seat there, Beatty. I'll only take a moment. Take your time, Doc. My big rush is over for a few weeks. As a matter of fact, that's what, uh, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. What do you mean? I'm afraid you've been rushing things a bit too much, Beatty. Now you're sounding like a doctor. <laughs> Perhaps I am, but... You're not uh, trying to tell me there's something wrong with me, are you? Well, not exactly. That is, uh, nothing that isn't easily remedied. I don't think I follow you. I'll be more explicit. You're going to have to slow down, Beatty. Slow down? Exactly. Your electrocardiograph indicates that you've been driving yourself much too hard. You mean the old tick is not what it should be? Oh, your heart's still in good shape, but uh, there are some warning signals that shouldn't be ignored. It's, uh, it's more a case of nervous exhaustion than anything. Oh, come now, Doc. There's nothing wrong with my nerves. Oh? Tell me, do you find it too warm in here, Beatty? Well, no, it, it's just comfortable. Why? Because your forehead is beaded with perspiration. Oh, well, that... It... You've been drumming your fingers on the arm of that chair ever since you sat down. And you've crossed and uncrossed your legs a half a dozen times. Have I? I hadn't been conscious of doing that. Nerves, Beatty. Nothing but nerves. Yeah, I suppose you're right. But what do I do about it? You've got to take it easy. Have some relaxation. <laughs> Well, that'll be easy. You see, we're in winter quarters now. Does that mean that you uh, won't have much to do? Sure. All I got to do is work out some plans and schedules for next season with Norman Carroll, my business manager. And, of course, I'll have to work up some new acts with the cats and try to get hold of a couple more elephants and some other animals. And then there's the new costumes. Stop. That... That's what I was afraid of. Huh? Do you consider doing all those things relaxation? Well, maybe not, but... Beatty, it... you're a young man. Blessed with a splendid body and good health. But you can't maintain such a pace indefinitely. You've got to give your nerves a rest now and then. Do something you really enjoy. <laughs> I really enjoy training lions and tigers. I know, but you must do something entirely divorced from your work. Take a vacation. Tell me, do you like fishing? Why, yes, I love to fish. As a matter of fact, next year I'm planning to spend a lot of time at it. Then may I suggest that you do it this year? Right now. But why right now? Because next year may be too late, Beatty. Think it over. We pause briefly for this message. And now, back to Clyde Beatty and time off for trouble. Although I didn't fully agree with Dr. Meyer that a vacation was absolutely necessary, I knew that he had good reasons for insisting. So I hurried home to tell Harriet about it. Why, Clyde, I think it's a wonderful idea. Don't you, Scotty? I sure do. Boy, what wouldn't I give to be along? Landing a 30-pound muskie now and then. <laughs> you make it sound so simple, Scotty. But what's holding you back? I'm going to fly my ship, and if you want to come along, we'd be glad to have you. We certainly would, Scotty. Where did you say you were going? Northern Minnesota, near the Canadian border. A little change wouldn't hurt you any either. 
You're a mess of nerves, Scotty. You've blinked your eyes twice in the last five minutes. Why, I'll bet your electro whatchamacallit has warning signals all over it. <laughs> <laughs> How about it, Scotty? We know you're a good equestrian director. But what kind of a fisherman are you? I don't know, but I've got a lot of work to do in Uh-oh, that. Uh-oh, that can wait. Just because you're in charge of the horses doesn't mean you have to work like that. Hey, get me. The doctor's got me doing it. What do you say, Scotty? <laughs> You've tortured me enough. Well, when do we leave? I'll call the doc right now, and we'll take off day after tomorrow. How's that? Perfect. We'll leave all our problems behind and just enjoy ourselves. Lake of the Woods, here we come. This is wonderful, Clyde. I'm glad the air is smooth. Me too. It's a perfect day for flying, visibility unlimited, just a few scattered clouds up high. Fun, huh? Oh, loads of fun. And the countryside. Oh, it's beautiful. Where are we now, anyway? Well, you see that river on our right there? Uh-huh, yes. That's this little crooked line on the map here. We're right about here. Oh, we're over Missouri, Scotty. Good. Let's keep right on going. Look way over to the west there on the horizon. Oh, what is it, Clyde? Kansas City. Ever been to the zoo there, Scotty? Clyde. Oops, sorry, I forgot. Mm, just can't keep your mind off animals, can you? Sure I can. Uh, ever been to the library in KC, Scotty? <laughs> <laughs> oh, many times. They've got a statue of a horse out in front. All right, you clown. <laughs> uh, 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 please, Harriet, mustn't talk shop, remember? Oh, I give up. <laughs> we, uh, we must be making pretty good time, aren't we? Yeah, I got a 12-mile tailwind. We're doing about 160 ground speed. You about sold me on this flying business. It's great. Sure, this is the way to travel if you've got the chance. Clive, the engine. What's wrong? I had to go and open my big jet. Just relax, everybody. I just ran one of the gas tanks dry. I'll switch to the other one. Oh. Goodness. That's the sweetest music this side of heaven. Guy Lombardo or no Guy Lombardo. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. There really wasn't any danger, though. I just got so interested in the scenery, I forgot to switch over before it ran dry. I had visions of dropping in on some farmer for lunch. Yeah, I had visions of dropping, but I wasn't thinking about lunch. Uh, speaking of lunch, we'll grab a bite and refuel at Des Moines, then push on for International Falls. And then, by trusty covered wagon to beautiful scenic Lake of the Woods. Where the deer and the muscalunge play. <laughs> Our trip to International Falls was completed uneventfully, and we landed just at dark. The doctor's friend, Ken Rogers, was there to meet us, and before we knew it, we were in his flivver heading for Kramer's Landing. We'll be there in an hour or so, Beatty. Famous Landing is on Lake St. Francis, about 35 miles up the way. That's fine, Mr. Rogers. It was certainly nice of you to take the trouble to make all the arrangements and take us up there. We appreciate it. Glad to do it. And we're to stay at this Kramer's Landing place? Nope. Uh, just sort of a jumping off place. Old man Kramer outfit parties that go on up into the lakes for the best hunting and fishing. You'll stay there tonight, of course. Then you'll head out for parts unknown by boat. Camp out from then on. Sounds like lots of fun. Don't have to run, just relax. <laughs> You'll enjoy it all right. I've arranged for one of the best guides in the business, a fellow named Gregor Martineau. Ah, sounds French. He's French, an Indian. Knows the lakes like the palmer's hand. Well, that's nice to know. Uh, from the sound of things, I guess it wouldn't be much of a trick to get lost around here. No trick at all. I know of parties that are going up into the lakes after deciding they could get along without a guide and... Some of them never was heard from again. <laughs> I have a feeling this fellow Gregor is going to be a very welcome addition to our little party. Kramer's Landing was little more than the name implied. A small boat dock extending into the lake a few yards, a general store patterned after the old Hudson's Bay trading posts, and a few small cabins. The next morning, we met Gregor, a man of some 40 years, dark and wiry, and not given to much conversation. He was impatient to get started, so we gathered together the few things we wanted to take and made our way to the dock. This fellow doesn't believe in wasting any time, does he? I guess not. But from here on, what he says goes. Did you notice? He never changes expression. Yeah, looks mad all the time. Quiet, he'll hear you. Well, here we are, Gregor. 
Boat all loaded. We go now. Okay. Come on, let's get aboard. Let me give you a hand, Harry. Oh. Oh, here, Clyde. We can both sit in this middle seat here. <laughs> no. Men sit in middle. You sit in bow. I guess he doesn't want too much weight in the bow, Harriet. Looks like you're elected. Oh, all right. Well, we're all set, Clyde. Sort of a boatload, huh? Yeah. We ought to have plenty of supplies anyway. You okay, Harriet? And what are we waiting for? Okay, Gregor, let's get underway. I start motor. We go. Well, we're off, folks. Off for a solid week of fishing and relaxing. In a few hours, we were many miles from Kramer's Landing. It might have been a thousand for all we knew, since there were no signs of civilization, no other people to be seen. About noon, after skirting countless islands and passing through the narrow channels which connected the many lakes, Gregor headed the boat toward a small, rocky inlet. The dense forest came up to the very edge of the lake. It looked green and mysterious. We gonna stop here, Gregor? We stop, make camp, then beach. Hot dog. That's what I've been waiting to hear. Oh, look, at the edge of the lake over there. Well, I'll be... A bull moose. Now, if we were hunting, we'd never see one. He doesn't seem to be the least bit afraid of us. He probably isn't. I understand they can be pretty rough customers, though. Well, looks like we've arrived someplace anyway. <laughs> that suits me. Be good to get out and stretch our legs. Yeah. And then the fun begins. Leave me at them muskies. <laughs> It was almost dark when we returned to camp from our fishing on the lake. We were tired but happy. We'd caught a couple of muskies and several bass and pike, and the fish dinner that Gregor fixed was really something. Afterward, we just sat around the fire talking about the big ones that got away and wondering what the next day had in store. Mm. Oh. Boy, I'm still stuffed. You're quite a cook, Gregor. Glad you like. I'll be back in a minute. Yeah, okay, Gregor. Oh, this is the life. <laughs> I think Dr. Meyer's favorite prescription is okay. I told him you'd have a... What were you starting to say, honey? Oh, nothing, Clyde. Hey, now, wait a minute. Were you in cahoots on this trip idea? Oh, I Clyde, whatever made you think that? My little fixer. So you put him up to all this, huh? Well, in a way. <laughs> I remember now, you didn't seem very surprised when I told you what he suggested. And I fell hook, line, and cardiograph for all that mumbo-jumbo he gave me. But, Clyde, you do need a rest. And it seemed like the only way to get you to take one. Scotty, never underestimate a woman. Well, I'm not sorry. And what he said about your being nervous was perfectly true. And you have been overworked. Okay, I'll give my shattered nerves a good rest. Yes. Since I'm enjoying everything so much, I'll forgive you. Oh, that's a man for you. Do something nice for him, and he forgives you. <laughs> this be plenty firewood for a night. Yeah, that ought to keep the home fires burning all right. We go bed now. Get sleep. Uh, you, you ready to turn in, Clyde? <laughs> Oh, it doesn't sound like we have much choice. Where are you going to sleep, Gregor? I stay by fire. I think I'll drag my sleeping bag over here, too. You kids are welcome to that canvas lean-to, only don't eat up all those supplies over there. We might not catch any more fish, you know. <laughs> don't worry. I won't be hungry for days. Oh, are you coming, Harriet? Oh, if I don't fall asleep before I get into my sleeping bag. See you in the morning, Gregor. Night, Scotty. Night. Good night. <laughs> Scotty and Gregor. Come on. 
Hey, Gregor, wake up. We got company. Uh, what's wrong? Why you run? Some animals rummaging around our supplies, Gregor. Oh, why you not scare him away? Because I want to know what it is first. Hey, where you going? I run him off. But Gregor, wait. Craig, he's running right toward whatever. Hey, get out of so here. What's all the excitement about? Oh, Scotty, there's an animal. Oh, 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 Gregor, he's being attacked. No time. Gregor's being killed. Clyde Beatty will be back in just a moment. But first... Now back to Clyde Beatty and his story, Time Off for Trouble. Clyde and Harriet Beatty, accompanied by Scotty McDonald, arrived at Lake of the Woods on the Canadian border, where they planned to spend several days fishing. They were turned over to Gregor, a French Indian guide, and after several hours of winding through the endless chain of lakes, stopped and made camp in the wilderness. Late that night, Clyde and Harriet awakened at the sounds of an animal moving around their supplies. They roused the others, and before they could stop him, Gregor ran toward the unknown animal to frighten it away. Then... Grabbing a large stick of firewood, I ran toward the lean-to again. In the darkness, I was just able to make out a small and spitting puma intent on murder. Get out of here, you devil! Get! Finally, I landed a terrific blow which would have stunned an ox. The lion darted off into the forest. Are you all right? Yeah, I am. But I'm afraid Gregor's in bad shape. That puma got in some nasty swipes. Come on, Clyde. Let's move him inside your lean-to. Get that lantern, Harriet. Easy. <clears throat> okay, Scotty. Come on. Poor devil. Here. I'll put him down on these blankets. Okay. <clears throat> Bring the lantern closer, Harriet. Oh, here. <gasps> oh, Clyde. Holy mackerel. Look at his face. Yeah, and across his neck. Yeah, these gashes are pretty deep. Scotty, get out that first aid kit. We've got work to do. Right. Do you think he... I don't know, Harriet. We'll do the best we can for him. It's starting to get light, Clive. Good. I guess that's about all we can do, but we've got to get him back to a doctor. Where's that map of the lakes old man Kramer gave you last night? Why, well, it's... It's... Oh, Clyde, I left it in that jacket. I decided not to bring it along. I was afraid of that. Why, Clyde, is, is it that important? I don't like to seem pessimistic, but Gregor is not the only one that's in bad shape. Meaning? Meaning, unless I'm badly mistaken, we're lost. He ought to be all right there in those sleeping bags. Guess everything's all set, Clyde. Okay. Cast off that line and shove us away from the rocks, huh? Right or Skipper, or uh, is it I, I? I'm <laughs> glad Scotty's keeping his sense of humor. <laughs> I'm glad, too, for his sake. I don't think he quite realized what a spot we're in. Is it really as bad as all that stuff? Honey, I'd rather be in an arena full of the meanest lions and tigers than be in this particular spot. Mm. Here, here we go. Jump aboard, Scotty. <sighs> there we are. Now, if Clyde can get that cool motor started, we're off. Yeah. Good boy, Clyde. You still got that pocket compass? Yeah, I've got it. And we did so much zigzagging coming up here, all I know is the general direction. I'm afraid I won't be much help. These lakes and islands and shorelines all look alike to me. Well, Clyde, you've been accused of having a photographic memory. Let's see you prove it. I won't promise a thing, but here goes. An overcast sky hid the sun as we started out, and the cold wind was blowing out of the north. It was soon evident that Rogers hadn't exaggerated a bit. I had quite a job ahead trying to retrace our course of the day before. It was something like watching a movie film being run backwards and trying to make sense out of it. But so far, everything was all right. Due to past experience in the jungles, I had subconsciously made mental notes of many landmarks the day before, and I recognized them now. One thing really bothered me, however. 
That was whether or not our gas supply would last. Clyde, are you sure that little island to the left is the one we passed yesterday? Well, I can't be positive, but I think it is. It sure doesn't look familiar to me. It seems we've been going for hours now. Shouldn't we be getting fairly close? I figure we've still got another hour or so, but... What's the matter, Clyde? Well, am I seeing things, or is that another boat over there? Where? Over to the right, heading up toward where we came from. It is. It is. Hooray! Oh, thank heaven. If I can just intercept them, we'll soon find out where we are for sure. We swung around to the right and raced full speed toward the other boat. But it was soon apparent that it was faster than ours, and we couldn't get closer than a couple of hundred yards. I could just make out the figures of two men across the expanse of choppy water separating our boats. Clyde! They've seen us, but they're going on. They don't know we're in trouble. Wave your arms, Scotty. Get their attention. Okay. Can't you catch them? No, they're going too fast. Oh, they're waving back at us. Oh, they must think we're just being friendly. That's great. I should have saved the gas. The knuckleheads. I wave like a wounded Comanche, and they politely wave back. We'll just have to keep going the way we were and hope it's right. How's Gregor doing, Scotty? Just a second. I'll check. Holy smoke, Clyde. His pulse is so weak, I can hardly feel it. Oh, Clyde, we've got to get him to a doctor. Keep him covered up. And keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> Luck was with us in more ways than one. The inlet proved to be the right one, and we discovered there was a Minneapolis doctor at Kramer's Landing all set for a fishing trip. He went right to work on Gregor, of course. And in a little while, we were told that with proper care, the guide would recover. Back in our own cabin, Harriet, Scotty, and I had a chance to breathe easily once more. Who was the joker who once said, there's nothing like a nice, quiet fishing trip to settle one's shattered nerves? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but whoever it was wasn't thinking of this fishing trip. Tell you what. Let's get back to uh, International Falls and then fly down to Chicago. We can spend a week in the big city, huh? Why, that sounds wonderful, Clyde. I can do some shopping while we're there. And we can catch up on all the good shows. Fair and... enough. We'll do it then, huh? Oh, you've got something up your sleeve, Clyde, baby. Out with it. Huh? What made you think of Chicago so suddenly? Why, you... Uh, nothing. I just thought of it. Come on. What's up? We'll <laughs> just try and put something over on you. All right, I had a letter from Reynolds last week. Reynolds? Oh, the animal dealer. Uh huh. Now we're getting someplace. And what did Reynolds have to say? He said he had an elephant and two Bengal tigers I could have first chance at. It'd be a shame not to grab them. We could use them, all right. We'd better hurry before somebody else gets them. Okay, let's get a move on then. <laughs> And so our vacation wasn't exactly what we'd planned originally, but we had fun and returned to Shreveport in fine spirit. The day after we got back, I went in to see Dr. Meyer, as he'd asked me to do. You don't have to say a word. I can tell just by looking at you that you had a wonderful vacation. Oh, we had a lot of fun. But... And the fishing, how was it? Well, we caught a few, all right. <laughs> Modest, eh, Betty? <laughs> I'll bet you caught a... Boat float every day. Well, to tell you the truth... Isn't that country beautiful, though? Well, it certainly is. And but... Rogers, did he take good care of you? Oh, yes, and we appreciated it, too. Well, but... you look like a different man, all right. I can tell you've done nothing but fish and relax the whole two weeks. I... I'll bet you can notice a difference in the way you feel, too. Never felt better, Doc. But... Of course not. Now, I want to give you some sound advice, Betty. Some sound advice? Yes, and it's very simple, but very important. I want you to plan to do this exact thing every year. What do you say? <laughs> I'll think it over, Doc. But just offhand, I'd say my nerves can't stand this sort of vacation every year. In a moment, we return with a word about Clyde Beatty's next adventure. Here is Clyde Beatty. As I ran to a Hollywood soundstage, the roars of an enraged lion in my ears, I had no idea I was about to meet perhaps the strangest of all the world's strange people I've encountered in my life with the circus. 
the man I met in a plaster of Paris lion grotto with a raging lion and an unconscious cameraman was Kurz. Kurz the clown, he called himself. But he was far more than a clown. It's his story, the story of Kurz the clown, that I want to tell you when next we meet. All stories are based upon incidents in the career of the world-famous Clyde Beatty and the Clyde Beatty Circus. The Clyde Beatty Show is produced by Shirley Thomas. Time Off for Trouble was written by Robert T. Smith. All names used were fictional, and any resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is a Commodore production. <laughs> <laughs>